Hi there, thanks for joining us. Today I am speaking with Anna Milne. She's from Wilson Asset Management and she is the Senior Investment Analyst at the WAM Leaders Fund. Anna, great to speak to you today. Thanks for having me. Now we're heading into the company reporting season. It's just around the corner. And I suppose something that's worth reflecting on is the period ahead of time is often characterized by perhaps some confessions. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, that's what it's referred to as the confession season before the profit season. Has there been anything in the last couple of weeks that has stood out for you? Fundamentally, there has been less standouts. I think what has really been surprising is the absolute roaring start that we've had to July overall when it comes to expanding valuations. And as you know, that's really been the, the cutting cycle coming to the fore sooner than expected. But it definitely does mean that we have to be more aware of positioning, uh, valuations and share prices into earnings season because should there be an earnings miss or an earnings beat, it really does matter where that starting share price is to determine the reaction on the day. Now, we have had a bit of a, a volatile start, I suppose, to the new financial year. We've been in, on the one hand, pulled by the US, but then back home we look at a vastly different set of circumstances you know we could see a rate hike from the rba potentially uh in in the next couple of months how does all of that figure into your tactical approach i suppose to to the market at this stage we are cautious about putting the cart before the horse here when it comes to a potential rba hike i think we've had the employment data out today it was broadly in line with expectations And I don't think the RBA wants to hike necessarily. They believe that they're sufficiently restrictive at the moment. And so we don't expect another hike to really come over the coming months, but undoubtedly we are lagging the rest of our developed economy peers in beginning the cutting cycle. Even the RBNZ, for example, they look like over the next month or two, they may begin their cutting cycle too. Which is significant because they were so aggressive in in the outset. So... Uh, When it comes to the different sectors, why don't we just talk about the miners because we're uh, speaking in the aftermath of two very important production reports from BHP and from Rio. Uh, Rio was a little bit patchy, Uh, BHP better than expected. How do you reverse engineer these outcomes? I think when it comes to the iron ore miners, it all really does come back to the iron ore price. And looking at where we've come from, Uh, China demand has been softer than expected, but steel production has remained relatively robust. We think over the next few months, we're looking into a seasonally soft period. We think there's a possibility of iron ore falling below 100 in the next four weeks. And that really throws up opportunities to enter the BHP, Rio and Fortescue at a lower price to where they're trading today. There are a few other noisy pieces of information in the market at the moment. The first is around the third plenum from China. We're looking for uh, data out of that. There hasn't really been anything material yet. And then secondly, again, might be getting ahead of ourselves, but should Trump uh, win the presidential election in the US, should he inflict more tariffs on China, uh, it might cause the Chinese government to need to stimulate more. So we're aware of all of these discussions when it comes to iron ore, but looking at the production reports, volume seemed fine. Uh, costs are still under pressure. CapEx is under pressure. And we even saw from Fortescue last night that they are uh, executing on a cost out program and they've pushed out their 2030 green hydrogen targets, which although environmentally it might be a bit more up for debate, certainly financially that's been the right decision for them. It's been a bit of a yoke around their neck, hasn't it? Because a lot of investment, not um, uh, less of the R uh, on the I. So um, do you think the market will react positively to that? Definitely. No one likes uncertainty. And yeah. what that has really provided for the market is uncertainty when there are great other options in BHP and Rio. So it does bring Fortescue to the table again. What about uh, in the healthcare space? Now, CSL has been uncharacteristic in its performance in in recent years. Uh, How do you rationalise what's taking place with that very important stock? I think when thinking about the healthcare sector overall, you're getting what you pay for. You either have eye-watering valuations or we have earnings uncertainty. And CSL is probably the only stock in the sector where you're in neither camp really. I would say that the valuation is fair and I would say that the earnings are relatively accurate when looking at what's forecasted over the coming years. 
So where does that leave us for the upcoming results? I think it's been a continuation of February trends. V4, their division that they recently acquired in Switzerland is looking soft still. Securus, flu, that's still challenge. But on the flip side, the bearing business, which is 70% of their earnings is charging ahead and they're really executing on their margin program. So I would say it's neither here nor there leading into results. But what I do have in the back of my mind is that uh, the market was disappointed with the result at February. Earnings yeah. did disappoint. And so if I were management, would you want to set lofty targets for 25? Probably not. You would set something achievable that you can then achieve and potentially beat down the track. So I think FY24 is locked in. We're maybe a little bit more concerned about 25. So I'd say we're neutral to slightly unders on CSL at the moment. So if, for example, they are conservative in terms of their forecast, the risk with that is that you get marked down because people think that you're not pushing the boat out far enough. Is that a problem for them? I would say so, particularly given the market is so driven by the algorithmic trades uh, and the, the, the fast money at the moment. And the market's expecting about 15% earnings growth next year, which is a great number. Uh, if they were to say they would deliver 10%, that's still really strong earnings, but it's 5% lower than where the market's currently sitting. So even if the fundamental investors think like I do and think that they will set themselves up for success later in the year, the market might not react accordingly. Let's talk about REITs because they are a, a group of companies that attract polarizing uh, opinions. Uh, I suppose that the challenge for them is that we're going to be later into a rate cutting cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, does that create problems for, for that group? Definitely. Again, if we look at where we're starting from, REITs are up 7% in the last week. So that's certainly taken the cream off the top when it comes to potential returns for these companies. And you're right, below the surface, there is so much dispersion. On one end of the spectrum, we have Goodman Group with their data center strategy. And on the other end, we have Challenged Office. Uh, so thinking about both those names, we expect Goodman will do what Goodman always does. They'll deliver, they'll, they'll then set guidance into next year, which they hopefully can, can beat and continue to upgrade. We think Dexas and GPT, uh, which are the two largest office stocks are actually looking quite interesting. We think they're close to the end of uh, the valuation downgrade cycle. They might have another 25 or 50 basis points to come. But overall, it feels like we are close to the bottom. They both have new CEOs who are both implementing the new strategies and aren't afraid to sell when they need to, to recycle that capital. So we're watching both names closely. In terms of the consumer space, uh, this has I suppose been a little bit like the banks in a way. There's been so much negativity towards that group. Uh, people have been expecting bad things, but as a sector, it's actually performed quite well, hasn't it? It has. And if you compare the consumer discretionary to the consumer staple so stocks, you would think that in our current regime, we're in a slowdown, we're in tight monetary policy settings. Uh, you'd think that staples would do really well relative and they've actually moved pretty much in line with each other at a headline level at an industry level uh, and for that reason we are still preferring the staples over the discretionary names just given that the run that I've had we still think there's potential downside to earnings we're seeing those from the smaller caps come through every day of confession season as you say uh, so we still prefer the likes of the supermarkets and Endeavour Group to the Wes Farmers and the JB Hi-Fi's of the world. Endeavour Group is a great example. There was so much promise for them when they got spun out, but mm. at this stage, that promise hasn't been delivered on. Does that present an op opportunity? It does, just because expectations are so low, uh, particularly in their hotels business. Everyone was very excited about this refurb opportunity yeah. and, and the ability to turn that around, but just even the gaming changes uh, have really been a headwind for Endeavour Group. Is that what's hanging over them? Because you know that people don't realise they're one of the biggest operator of poker machines in the country and is it that regulatory risk that's uh, hanging over the organisation? Definitely and it's just about being unable to price for an unknown risk. Yeah. Uh, why would you take that risk if you don't need to necessarily? But on the flip side of things their retail business is really strong. I mean Dan Murphy's is one of the best franchises in the country and I think that's almost uh, forgotten about at times when considering Endeavour Group as an investment opportunity. And uh, tell me, what are you going to be paying most attention to in this reporting season? What's the uh, point uh, that 
changes your thinking or that might present an inflection point more broadly? Again, it just comes back to where expectations will land uh, and maybe using the human factor to work out whether companies are being conservative or whether they're playing a straight bat because yeah. I think that's really where the opportunities lie. Given again, we have seen so much distortion in the market, we've had so many valuation swings, uh, comes back to being disciplined and taking a proper look and meeting the companies, talking to the management teams and working out the portfolio from there. Anna, it's been a pleasure talking to you today. Thank you very much, and I hope the reporting season goes well for you. Thanks, Tom. You too. And thanks very much for joining us for the Executive Series today.